Season's greetings. I'm Dr. William Lester coming to you from the studio of Blackwater Media in the great city of Atlanta. Welcome to Blackwater Media's 2022 Year in Special, a collection of Blackwater Media's best paranormal and supernatural encounter stories from the past year. I hope that you and yours are having a wonderful holiday season. So sit back, enjoy, and have a happy new year. My brother and I grew up in the middle of nowhere. It was a dead-end street with a total of eight houses on it, with a total of four other kids to play with. The street was roughly a mile long if you did a whole lap, so it was the perfect place to run after school. On the longest stretch of road, there was a forest on one side and a large field on the other. The field was unkept and usually had pretty long grass that would come up to about your knee. Anyway, one afternoon my brother and I went running and less than a quarter of a mile into the run, we saw something run across the road from the field into the woods. All right, now check this out. It was large and it ran on two legs, but the sense of balance was all wrong for a human. The best way I can describe it is that it leaned backwards, kind of like a bear would when it's on two legs, but it moved super fast way faster than any person or animal that I've ever seen. My brother said that he saw horns and antlers on it, but a deer wouldn't be able to run that far on two legs, and it was much, much faster than a deer anyway. We turned around and went right back home. Since then, I've tried searching the internet for what I saw, and the closest thing that I could find to match was a thing called a Wendigo. I still don't know what the thing was, but I damn sure hope I'm wrong about it being a Wendigo. About three years ago, I was out hunting with my dad, grandpa, and uncle. We split up into two groups. Me and my dad were in a group and my grandpa and uncle in the other. We were hunting in the same area and we brought walkie-talkie so we could talk to each other if we got something. My dad and I were walking down a hill and exiting the forest and entering a field and there was another hill in front of us from the other side. We heard coyotes howling. We stood listening to them for a second. After about 20 seconds of listening, we heard another noise from behind us. It sounded like a weird mix of a roar and a howl. Now I've heard coyotes in my life and I've never heard one that sounded like that. When we turned around though, we saw something right out of a damn nightmare. It was a large, black, canine looking creature standing next to a tree. And this thing was huge and was easily four feet at the shoulder. But what got me was those disproportionately large eyes. They were orangish and so big that I could see it blink every few seconds. It didn't charge us or run away. It just stood there staring at us as if to say, leave while you still can. After a while, it started to get dark and we called my grandpa and uncle on the walkie-talkies and told them what we'd seen. They agreed that it was a good time to get the hell out of the woods and that we'd meet back at the vehicle. We clicked on our flashlights to see better and right at that moment, we heard a branch break 
and then another loud, roarish howl behind us. When everyone was back at the truck, my dad explained again what happened, and the look on my uncle's and grandfather's faces was a look of shock and terror. They didn't see anything, but they said they'd heard the howl. We all loaded into the truck and left. A really long time went by before any of us set foot in those woods again. I've heard a number of the Dogman encounter stories on Blackwater Media, and I thought I'd throw my two cents in and share my own experience. I live in central Michigan, about 20 minutes north of Lansing. I was on my way home from work, and it was about a quarter to two in the morning. I was going about 55 and saw something about 100 yards away stand up on two legs out of the ditch on my passenger side take three to four running steps and completely clear a 24 foot road and got about six or seven feet up in the air. Now this thing landed on the other side of the road and it went down on all fours and took off running across the field on my driver's side. I slowed down to see if I could get a good look at it and it was huge. It was covered in black fur and it was fast. Now in terms of how it looked in detail, I can only describe this thing as the biggest wolf I'd ever seen. There was an otherworldly quality to it, the way it moved, the power it displayed. It's really hard to explain it, but it felt as though I was trapped inside of the worst nightmare I'd ever had. Let me stop right here and say this. The long pointed ears and the wolf's snout were bad enough, but man, those eyes. This creature had two huge fucking eyes that were like a surreal mix of yellow and orange. I can tell you this, there was something in those eyes that conveyed pure hatred, rage, and evil. The creature cleared about 150 yards in a matter of seconds and ran into a stand of trees in the middle of the field, and I lost sight of it. There was a decent amount of moonlight, so I could see it fairly well. It had to have been at least eight feet tall because the ditch is three to four feet deep and I could see the torso and head poking out of the ditch before it jumped. Once I lost sight of it, I didn't waste any time getting the hell out of there. If you're a skeptic or maybe on the fence on whether or not Dogman exists, get your ass off the fence and join the club. They're real. It's so terrifying to know that creatures like that are out there lurking around, waiting, watching. On May 26, 2017, me, my brother Brandon, and his friend Herbie went on a spur-of-the-moment camping trip. The spot we had in mind was a place not far from where we lived, behind a church called Holtz Baptist Church. When I got off work, I met Brandon and Herbie at our grandparents' house to get our gear ready. We made it a sort of bare-bones trip due to the short amount of time we had to get everything ready. Of course, Being the outdoor lover she was, my dog, Angel, was going to tag along with us. She's a Jack Russell Rat Terrier mix. We loaded up our gear and ourselves into my grandfather's blue Ford pickup, and we were off towards our spot. It's about a 10-minute drive from our grandparents' house, so in a short time, we arrived there. The place where you park is beside the church, and it's gated off, so nobody can take their trucks or four-wheelers down in the gravel road. So we unloaded the truck, 
climbed over the gate, and started making our way towards the campsite. About a hundred feet down the gravel road, the lake had risen up into it, so we couldn't walk across and keep going. Instead, we found a small deer trail that led up to the bank and around the water. There was a lower trail that ran parallel to the bank, and the higher trail went up a little higher. Now for whatever reason, we took the higher trail. For a short while, we snaked through the woods and finally we reached the end of the deer trail. It abruptly ended at the side of the bank and we had to slide down at about 10 feet to get back onto the gravel road. Once we were all back down, it was about a third of a mile back to where we would be setting up camp. And it was hot as hell that day and there were ticks and mosquitoes biting us constantly. When we made it to camp, we set our stuff down and started looking for ticks that might have hitched a ride on our pant legs. And sure enough, we found a lot of ticks on us all. This irritated Brandon extremely as he found one in his hair. Herbie and I just laughed as he cursed and fumbled around trying to get the tick off of him. Shortly after that, we set up camp. It was a simple campsite just nestled down in a small flat spot down near the lake. It actually was a really nice spot. I started setting up the tent and I sent the other two with the axe to look for some dry firewood. I tied Angel to a small tree next to the tent and as soon as I got it set up she plopped down in front of it as if she had put it up or something. About that time the guys had drug back some sticks and things like that back to the site. Some of them were dry but most of them were a little damp. Now I'm pretty good at making fire, so with a little persuasion, the fire finally got started around dusk or so. My brother jokingly yelled out, when are you gonna cook some food? I'm starving. I agreed and went to my backpack to get the cast iron skillet out, only to realize that I'd left the stupid thing sitting at the house instead of putting it in the bag. Slightly irritated, I went to get the hot dogs out of the cooler. I guess we'll be cooking our wieners on a stick tonight, boys, I said as I turned around holding the pack of hot dogs. Then I noticed Brandon's peace tea can laying on the ground in front of him. I asked him to hand me the can, and I promptly cut off the top, washed it out, filled it halfway with some of our drinking water, put some hot dogs in it, and set it down in the coals of the fire. Turned out, we didn't even need the stupid cast iron skillet. After about 10 minutes, the hot dogs were done, and we were all ready to eat. I handed them out, and we all chowed down. Of course, I couldn't leave Angel out, so I ripped one of the hot dogs up and gave it to her. We all finished and put the food stuff away. I grabbed a red bull out of the cooler, cracked it open, and asked Herbie if he'd ever seen a ghost before. Well, shit, I can't see what doesn't exist, he said, laughing back. I just looked at him and said, You mean you don't believe in ghosts? No, nah, man, that shit ain't real. That shit's just for movies. Now Brandon and I had shared some of our stories with Herbie before, and he didn't believe us. And then he said, Man, y'all were on mushrooms or something when you saw that shit. There's no way it was actually real. And he just kept laughing. Then I told him, One day something's gonna happen to you, and it's gonna scare you shitless. And you're gonna have no explanation for it. And when it does, you'll believe me then. He just shrugged it off and we continued to talk about all kinds of different things for a few more hours. We were all kind of tired after just talking and shooting the shit, so we all agreed that it was time to hit the sheets. We all climbed into the tent and started getting settled in. From left to right, it was me and Angel, Brandon, and Herbie. I think Herbie and I fell asleep before Brandon. Now, I'm not sure how long I was asleep before Brandon woke me up saying, God, there are a lot of fucking ticks all over this tent and they're getting on me. In my state of half sleep, I just told him to shut up and go back to sleep. He said he hadn't been to bed yet because of the ticks. And he said he was hearing things outside the tent too. Something splashing around in the water. I told him it was probably fish and not to worry about it. I fell asleep again. And about an hour later was woken up once more. But this time I was hearing things outside the tent too. Brandon had fallen asleep. And behind our tent... I could hear what sounded like somebody getting out of the lake and taking steps through the woods. It sounded like when you get out of the pool and all of the water kind of splatters and drips underneath you. That kind of freaked me out, but I was so damn sleepy I just fell back asleep right after that. 
Then I was woken up again, and this time it was Brandon smacking me to get up. I raised up and asked him what the hell was wrong with him. I found a tick in my goddamn ear. I'm tired of this stupid campsite. Let's just get out of here. I looked at my phone and it was about 4 a.m. at this point. So I sighed and agreed to leave just so he'd shut the fuck up about it. We shook Herbie awake and got out of the tent. It was pitch black out, so I tried to start the fire back up, but all the wood was too damp and it just wouldn't catch again. With no light, I went searching for my flashlight I brought with us, turned it on, and nothing. It was completely dead. Just fucking great. I got my iPhone and turned the flashlight on that on. And the warning popped up saying, I only had 20% battery left. This couldn't get any goddamn better. So I was highly pissed by this point. I told him to help me get all the stuff together so we can leave before the phone dies and we don't have any light. Like every camping trip ever, the gear you bring is never packed up well when you leave. Our sleeping bags were sloppily rolled up. The tent bag was stuffed full in a very awkward way which made it hard to carry properly. Our chairs kept coming undone and getting caught on everything. It wasn't a very fun walk. I was walking Angel on her leash with my other hands full of gear. The other guys had their hands full too and Brandon was carrying the axe in a very haphazardous way. My hands were so awkwardly packed I had to set it all down and readjust it all. Once I set it down, I looked down at Angel, and she was dead fixed on something in front of us in the darkness, her hair standing up on her back, and she was growling. I assumed it was a raccoon or possum, and just motioned her to look away, and she wasn't having it. She stayed locked onto the dark and wouldn't budge. I just readjusted my stuff, and we pushed on. As we were walking around the last corner to where the lake had come over the gravel path, I caught sight of something running on two legs around the corner towards the water. The boys didn't see it, but this thoroughly freaked me out and I demanded that Brandon give me the axe in exchange for Angel. We slowly walked forward and then we all saw it. It was a humanoid shaped figure. It looked short, maybe three feet tall, and it looked as if it had no neck. It seemed to have features like an amphibian. It had large yellow eyes that kind of bulged out and its mouth was shaped like a frog or a salamander. Angel started nearly choking herself trying to chase the creature, growling and barking angrily. Upon hearing Angel, it immediately turned and ran towards the water and dove right in. In disbelief, we stood there listening to it splash around and then it started screeching. It sounded aggressive and scared the shit out of us. Get up the goddamn bank now, I yelled to the boys, and we all ran for the bank. Now mind you, this bank is about 10 feet high and is nearly straight up and down. We all frantically tried to get up and struggle because of all the gear we were carrying. Angel was fighting Brandon trying to go back and fight the creature, and it was preventing him from getting up the bank. At this point, I hear the creature get out of the water and start running towards where we were. It was making a strange gurgling noise as it was running. My fear took over and I reached down to Brandon, grabbed his pants by the waist, and threw him and Angel both up onto the top of the bank. And then I just yelled, Trail! Run! Go! It's coming up the goddamn bank! And I wasn't lying. As we started running, I could hear it scratching at the shale bank behind us, continuing to make that disturbing, gurgling noise. We all ran through the woods fighting low-hanging branches, blackberry bushes, spider webs, and roots, and we heard the creature jump back in the water and screech at us again. We ran until we saw what we didn't want to see, the bank again. We'd taken the wrong trail and ended up closer to the water and therefore the creature too. My brother and Herbie were both in tears and screaming, what the fuck is that thing? What do we do? So shit, I started swinging the ax and hitting anything I could to try to scare the creature away. I started screaming back at it. But then, we started hearing things walking up above us, too. I picked Angel up, and we all just made our own path back down to the gravel road. Once we got down on gravel, we ran as fast as we could back to the truck. In a blind panic, I forced the rear hatch open, threw Angel in, shoved Herbie into the back seat, Brandon jumped into the passenger seat, and I got in. As soon as the engine started, 
I took off as fast as the little Ford would go. And the ride home was quiet. I broke silence with the question, Did that really just happen? Is everybody all right? They both replied, Yeah, it really did. And I could see the look of genuine terror in both of their faces. We stopped at a Waffle House in town for breakfast and just sat there quietly. Everybody was still freaked out. Even our waitress noticed we were pallid and asked what was wrong. We made up some bullshit because God knows she wouldn't have believed us if we did tell her. It truly did scare us all, and I really don't know what it could have been, except some kind of monster. And it was unforgettable. Let me tell you about something that I saw on a very cold, dry November night in 1976. My family and I moved into a new house upon a hill on a little back road in the very small town of Fort Gay, West Virginia. Now, Fort Gay sits right on the east side of Kentucky. The population of my town then was probably just a couple of thousand. Well, my family and I were still unpacking and we'd not yet put the furniture in place, and everything was still in boxes. Overwhelmed with working all day, I went to bed around 11 o'clock. I put my little brother on the couch, and I took his bed, since my bed wasn't put together yet. His room faces the front of the house, and his window is around 20 to 25 feet or so off the ground. I was looking out the window when I saw it. It stood about seven feet tall, I had no fucking idea what it was, but I was frozen. I'd never been that scared in all of my life. All I could do was lay there and just stare at this thing. It was sitting in a tree about 50 feet or so off the ground, about 50 feet from the house across the yard. It felt like an eternity. I couldn't breathe. Hell, I couldn't even blink. This damn thing had big, red, bright glowing eyes looking dead into my face. I finally worked up enough courage to close my eyes and put my head under the covers, when all of a sudden, this thing smacked the window. I jumped up, running through the house screaming, there's something outside. I was crying. My mom and dad looked at me and said, what's wrong with you? Looks like you've seen a ghost. And My face was flushed, and I said, I don't know what it was, but please dad, don't go outside. I begged and I begged, but he did. After a few minutes, he came back in and said, there was nothing out there. But I kept screaming saying, yes, there is. Yes, there is. Now, when I explained to them what I saw and how I felt, they said I was crazy. But to this day, I have a hard time going outside by myself. And even in the daytime, I still like it when somebody's around just to watch and see if I'm safely into my car. I've heard some pretty scary, crazy things going on up on that road, but I never expected to experience anything myself. You know, it's strange. My wife and I went to the theaters and saw Mothman Prophecies. I started reliving that night all over again. When I realized that the movie was based on the John Keel book, I bought a copy and found that the actual story was even more terrifying than the film. The way the book described the reactions and feelings after seeing the creature mirrored my own. My wife asked me, isn't that what you described to me when we first started dating? I couldn't say a word. After that, I knew exactly what I'd seen. I believe in all heart of hearts, I saw Mothman. Weird doesn't even begin to describe it. I should tell you this. We only live about 80 miles south of Point Pleasant, West Virginia, where it all took place originally back in the 60s. Even scarier, 
I realized that my sighting took place on the exact same day, 10 years after the first documented sighting of the Mothman in 1966. The exact same day. A couple of months ago, two friends and I were out cold weather camping in Newton, Illinois on their property. I remember that there was a nice clear sky and a bright three quarter moon. We almost didn't need flashlights at all. And even though there were coyotes in the area, and if you don't know, they're thick as thieves out there. So it's not uncommon to hear them pretty close. Well, we just finished eating and were small talking around the fire when we started hearing howls. We were listening to what seemed like three different ones. They were going back and forth for about 20 minutes, and it seemed like they were a couple of hundred yards apart. We all commented on how loud they were and decided maybe it was time to get some shut-eye. Now, one of my friends jumped into his tent. He has a problem with his immune system, so he gets sick easily. I didn't have the heart to tell him he couldn't tag along, so we pretty much buried him under a ton of blankets, and we just crawled into our sleeping bags at the fire and stargazed a bit. Now the howls started getting closer and we could hear some coyotes also running around and yipping at each other out in the field nearby. Not a big deal. We all take firearms out there with us for protection because the coyotes have recently been killing young livestock and pets in the area. If there's enough of them in the pack, I doubt they would think twice about trying their luck on a human being. Then the howling stopped. The last one we heard was probably a hundred yards away. We looked at each other just as the howl went off in the tree above the tent. Only, and this is the part that freaks me out the most, whatever it was was that fucking close and we didn't even know it. Then it broke into an aggressive growl. I broke the zipper on my bag scrambling for my AR. When I grabbed a hold of it, I looked at my buddy who was in the process of securing his own weapon and his eyes looked like they were about to pop out of his head. We threw our backs up against the tent flap and started trying to wake our friend up while almost spinning our heads off trying to see whatever there was to see. We finally got him to respond and as soon as he asked what the hell was wrong, whatever it was burst from behind the tent through the brush and dead trees we were using for our fire. It ran up the little walking path up into the field. Now to paint you a picture, that's where we had come from about three hours prior, back from a night hike across the property. Anyway, it started running away through the brush on two legs, and as soon as it hit the trail, dropped onto all fours and turned its head back to look at us. So what did it look like? The front legs were clearly larger and longer than the back. It had short ears, gray fur, and it had a snout that reminded me of a Doberman. The firelight flickering really helped give me a good look at its teeth and eyes. And although it had a mouthful of crazy ass werewolf looking teeth, it was those eyes that got me. They were fucking huge, like the size of my fist. And they were hot yellow. I was like, shit, that's it. We grabbed our blankets and guns and slept at the house that night and went back to clean up the campsite the next morning. We couldn't find any prints, but our fire was scattered and had a large tree branch in it, like maybe that goddamn thing came back and beat the fire to put it out or something. I know my friend refuses to talk about it. Every time I bring it up, he just gets quiet and changes the subject. Now, as scary as it all was, I don't have nightmares or anything like that. But since then, I refuse to go into the woods or camping, fishing, anything without a gun.
The Okefenokee is the largest swamp in North America. The swamp covers roughly 700 square miles and is located in the southeastern corner of Georgia, encompassing most of Charlton and Ware counties and parts of Brantley and Clinch counties. Now granted, some of those names might not mean much to those of you outside of the state, but for Georgia folk, well, you get it. The swamp has a distinctive and fascinating natural history. Cypress swamps, winding waterways, and floating peat mats are a major part of the Okefenokee's habitat mosaic. Wet and dry prairies, swamps dominated by shrubs, and forests of black gum and bay trees intersperse the array of other habitats. A high ridge of sand known as Trail Ridge forms the eastern edge of the swamp, and wildlife abound. More than 400 species of vertebrates, including more than 200 varieties of birds and more than 60 kinds of reptiles are known to inhabit the swamp. But the Okefenokee is also a universe unto itself and is known to harbor all manner of mystery, strange unknown creatures, wandering phantoms, and visitors from the sky. Come with me now if you dare and explore the bizarre realities of the haunted Okefenokee. An unusual UFO was sighted on the east side of the swamp in May of 1998. The descriptions vary, but the sighting was observed over several miles in a north to south direction. The editor of a local newspaper gave a brief description of the UFO in an editorial. The UFO was described as a large, shiny black object, which hovered for some time, then broke apart into quite a few smaller objects, which flew away all in different directions. And no explanation has ever been given for the strange UFO. In early 1996, a former Everglades National Park ranger on a vacation from upstate New York visited Okefenokee's west side for canoeing and bird watching. He put his canoe in at Stephen Foster Park and paddled over to Billy's Island. He did not return to the par. His canoe was found that evening on Billy's Island. Federal, state, and local officials immediately started a search which escalated over the next few days and weeks to an extremely extensive search for the man. Exhaustive searches of Billy's Island were conducted. Hand-to-hand -hand searches combing the entire island turned up nothing. Bloodhounds were brought in. The hounds could not pick up a scent beyond a small loop, and they turned up nothing. Heat-seeking infrared helicopters were brought in, sensitive enough to identify small animals and this man weighed over 300 pounds, and still they turned up nothing. Hope was almost given up until one day, some 40 plus days after the disappearance, a bedraggled man was seen by a boater leaning against a tree near the water's edge on Billy's Island. A day after this sighting, a dazed man identified himself to some passing canoeists as the missing man. Now, the man has never publicly stated that he was abducted. Speculation around the swamp is that he was taken without his knowledge from the island and then returned sometime after the search had been scaled down with his memory seemingly erased. A classic UFO abduction. Back in the 1930s, a man was fishing along the tracks at Henson Creek near Manor. He fell asleep one night with the rails as his pillow the train appeared, sounding its whistle frantically, but there was no response. Steel wheels kept on rolling, and the fisherman was killed. The legend holds that the body can be seen walking the rails at night, swinging a phantom lantern in search of its head. One man claims that his grandfather went in search of the ghost one night, and sure enough, it approached. Solid white and six feet tall, walking directly toward the grandfather, who fired a futile shot before fleeing. A log cabin on Okefenokee's east side by an area called Camp Cornelia on Trail Ridge is the location of a haunting that took place in the early 1990s. A former refuge volunteer who resided in the cabin 
reported strange visitations of spirits. Now, these spirits were clearly Native Americans in full regalia. The spirits didn't seem to be aware of the walls and boundaries of the cabin, but seemed attached to the land the cabin was on. They seemingly went about their daily tribal existence without concern. In his book, This Magic Wilderness, author Robert Latimer Hurst relates the following. Traders Hill was a flourishing port for water trade in the frontier southeastern region. This small outpost community compared to the surrounding settlements of the time was an active metropolis. Begun as a trading post in 1755, the village about five miles south of Folkestone, Georgia survived until the early 1900s on the river that once separated the Royal Colony of Georgia from the Spanish holdings and the Seminole nations to the south. At the end of Main Street stood a huge oak, the Hangman's Oak of Traders Hill. It was said the old oak could tell story upon story of mysterious events around the Riverbank Village. In the autumn of 1840, this massive tree played a major role in a mysterious drama, as reported by Troy Jones in the Charlton County Herald. An elderly Indian named Suwani, accused of stealing some goods from the general store and of killing the owner, had been captured and placed in the town jail. If he escaped, he could swim 30 yards to safety. Therefore, he was well guarded. Escape into Florida from Traders Hill was frequently made good since the St. Mary's River is only a short distance and very narrow at this point. Suwani had prepared for this day. His grandfather, for whom the river Suwani was named, it is said, had told him to starve himself until he could easily slip through the cell bars if he should ever become a prisoner of the white man. This he did but his feebleness would not allow the old warrior freedom. After a speedy trial, he was carried out to the huge oak for execution. When the noose was placed around his neck, the Indian prayed. He then lifted his head and spoke, May the curse of my father's spirit and mine be placed among the people as long as there is a traitor's hill. Not paying any heed to the defiant old warrior, the people, after hanging him, went on about their way. But all was not settled. One night, as the villagers were attending a county dance, a bright light cast its beam in the eyes of the merrymakers. Astonished, they looked toward this phenomenon. The gleam came from the oak. Accompanying the glow, a low moan whined through the countryside. Immediately, so writes Jones, people began to leave their homes and Traders Hill. Some who visit the Lonely Ridge today assert that on certain nights, the light can still be seen and the distant sound of moaning is still heard. Local legend around the Okefenokee Swamp holds that Spanish explorers who ventured into the vast area swore the forest turned into giant warriors who launched showers of arrows against them. Today, phantom deer, bears, and panthers that can only be killed by special bullets are said to roam the islands at night. And on stormy nights, ghost slave ships slip up the St. Mary's River amid sounds of clanking chains that can be heard by observers. Skeleton crews sail the boats up this winding waterway to unload their forbidden cargo on isolated sandbars. During the 1920s, a railroad was built to transport lumber out of the swamp. While crossing Floyd's Island, the largest in the swamp, it became necessary to cut through an extensive half-moon-shaped Indian mound. And within it, workers found the skeletons of several giant-sized men accompanied by pottery and beads. Tom Chesser, who owned Chesser Island in Charlton County, had a sizable mound in his backyard. In 1969, he told the Atlanta Journal and Constitution that a professor from a northern university was brought in to excavate the mound in the 1920s. 
they discovered 13 skeletons in all. Chesser maintained that some of the skeletons were crossed, one on top of the other. Some were face down. All of them were perfect when they were first discovered. Teeth even still had some glaze on them, but when the air struck, it crumbled them. But they were giants. Those jawbones would go over my whole face. Chesser Island is now part of the Okefenokee National Wildlife Refuge. The Chesser Homestead is a part of the Refuge Systems Heritage Preservation Program. The Indian Mound itself is located on the grounds of the Chesser Homestead. As you may recall, I mentioned earlier Trail Ridge, the ancient geological feature which makes up the eastern boundary of the swamp. Well, back in January 1998, a traveler on vacation and hiking near the boardwalk area was surprised by the sound of drums in the distant piney woods. Native American specters carrying objects and walking swiftly in a single file line were sighted off in the distance, heading south on the ridge. He reported no sense of hostility, but felt uneasy, as if he were seeing something he should not be observing. Of course, the swamp has had its share of Bigfoot sightings. Such creatures have been spotted along isolated creeks that meander through the woods to the St. John's River. Reports describe creatures as being up to eight feet tall, very hairy, powerfully built, walking upright, with footprints up to 18 inches long and eight inches wide, a pug nose, and smelling really bad. It sounds like Bigfoot to me. Two farmers were deer hunting near the Waycross side of the swamp and observed a seven and a half foot tall creature covered with grayish brown hair crossing the southern railroad tracks. The creature stopped and stared at them for a while and they stared back. The large humanoid finally lumbered off disappearing into the swamp. Several years before, a family visiting their grandmother's house at the Okefenokee Swamp was passing the time fishing, and suddenly the mother began screaming and pointing at this thing that was carrying away their string of fish. This story was later related to the Georgia Swamp Ape Research Center. He said he was 12 at the time, and he said that the creature was 30 yards in the distance, loping along the creek. The father shouted angrily at the animal and pursued it until he got close and it turned around and screamed. The father turned and ran, and quickly gathered the family into the car and left. That night, the grandmother informed the family that she heard stuff around all the time, but stayed in the house at night. Thank you for listening to the Shadowland radio show. If you're listening on the Blackwater Media YouTube channel, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. You can also listen at blackwatermedia.net and the Blackwater Media Facebook page. I'm Dr. William Lester, and I promise to see each and every one of you again on the flip side.
You're listening to the Blackwater Media Radio Network, the finest in digital audio entertainment. This is Blackwater Media coming to you from the great city of Atlanta. One Saturday night, back when I was in high school, some of my friends and I decided to go out. Nothing unusual, right? One of my friends needed a ride, so I went to his house to pick him up. He asked me to come in because his mother wanted to meet me. You see, he told his mother that I'm also Mexican-American and love La Virgen de Guadalupe, the Virgin Mary, and had a small altar to her in my home. While I was there, his mother asked if I wanted to see their altar And of course, I said yes. She led me to a small bedroom, which looked like it was a little girl's room, or had been. But it was full, and I do mean full of candles, statues, pictures of Jesus, Mary, and many Catholic saints. There were rosaries, crosses, crucifixes, roses, and every kind of item that a Mexican-American Catholic would have. I was surprised. And although I thought it was amazing and beautiful, I had an uncomfortable feeling. My friend's mother asked me if I knew about my friend's little sister, and I didn't. She told me that it was her room. She passed away when she was 10 due to leukemia. My friend had never told me about this, and I assumed it was because it was just too hard to talk about, understandably. After we left, I told my friend how sorry I was to hear about his little sister. He only said thank you, and we didn't speak further about it until about a year later. One night I was talking to him on the phone about a strange paranormal experience I had that really scared me. He told me he understood and asked if he could tell me more about his little sister. He told me how his family found out about his sister having leukemia, and how when the time came, they felt it was best if she passed at home in her own bed surrounded by her family. The last few nights of her life were, of course, very difficult for his family, but one night was far worse. It was late in the evening, but not completely dark yet, and they heard someone playing a fiddle in the backyard just outside of his sister's bedroom window. The song being played was not a very fast song, but a somewhat happy-sounding song. The family didn't really pay much attention to it until they also heard someone singing along with it. And whoever was singing was also saying the name of the little girl who was dying. And I'm sure you'll understand why I prefer not to include her name in this story. My friend was the first to look out the window. And he told me what he saw looked like the stereotypical devil with goat legs, horns, and a tail. It was about four feet tall and was leaning against the fence in a casual way. It was smiling singing and playing the fiddle happily. Of course, when he saw this, he didn't know what to do, but he felt like he had to act quickly. He called his father over to show him. As they watched, they realized what the creature was singing. It was saying something like, I'm so happy to be taking this little girl with me tonight. Come with me. Come with me. And would include her name over and over. It would even dance a little from time to time. At first, my friend's father wanted to shield the family and act like it was just a neighbor playing loud music. But the creature began to sing and play louder until the whole family could hear what it was saying. They were horrified, but somehow knew that their best option was to ignore it, to not give it any attention, to not allow it to scare them or give them doubts. They knew if they called the police, the police wouldn't believe them. And what could the police do anyway? They believed that this creature, or demon, was there to distract them, to trick them, and to make them lose their faith. The demon continued to sing, and the family continued to pray and be with the little girl. The family felt the best way to fight the demon was with prayer and love. And she did pass away that night, and the demon stopped singing when she passed. My friend told me that it was the greatest test of faith he'd ever lived through. 
He knows the demon did not succeed in taking his sister and has faith that love conquers all. As I listened to this story, I was shocked and horrified. But more importantly, I was amazed at his family's wisdom, strength, and faith. I greatly appreciated that he felt safe telling me this story because it gave me hope. Hope that good can overcome evil. I'd like to take just a few minutes to share an extraordinary experience with everyone. My girlfriend and I live in rural northern Michigan. The closest town is about 20 miles away, and the next closest is almost double that. We live right next to a huge national forest, so there's plenty of wildlife all over the place. Anyway, my girlfriend works nights and has for most of our relationship. She's a night shift nurse at one of the few hospitals within a 50 mile radius. I would often take her to work and pick her up, so we were on the road at night a lot. One night a few weeks back, I was headed to get her from the gym, which she would sometimes go to after her shift. I had our dogs with me, a two-year-old Doberman and a 14-year-old Husky. We came around a corner by our neighbors, and they have a large pasture with one horse in it. Now never in four years had I ever seen that horse out of his barn past nightfall. He comes and goes, in and out of his shed with the rising sun and with nightfall. You can see into his shed as you round the corner. We got to the tree line on the back of the pasture and I saw something completely insane. It looked like a horse, but from the second I saw it, I knew it wasn't a horse. It was 4.30 a.m., and I'd just seen him in his shed. All my hair stood up, my heart beat like a drum, and I got a very, very weird feeling. Also, I had to tap the brakes because we were approaching a stop sign. I looked over at my Doberman in the passenger seat to see him with all his hair raised and his teeth bared. He let out a guttural growl that I could feel in my chest. Now, I could remember the only other time I'd ever seen him like that was the day my father was walking around our backyard one evening and he didn't know he was out there. He's a very docile dog and it takes a lot to get him worked up. I had goosebumps and chills the whole 20 miles to town. Now in terms of what I saw, like I said, it was the size of a horse, but it was actually something that I could only describe as a humongous wolf. It sounds incredible, I know, but that's exactly what this damn thing looked like. Aside from its size, I can remember getting a really unsettling feeling by the look of its eyes. They were a weird haze of orange and yellow, and there was nothing good in them. When I told my girlfriend about it, she almost immediately uttered two words that I wish I'd never heard, Michigan Dog Man. But from there, things just got more bizarre. Just a few days ago now, my girlfriend was on her way home after work and the gym, one of the few times that she drove herself, when she came across something terrifying. She said she saw what looked to be a fairly large deer eating some trash that had been knocked over from a trash can at the end of a driveway. She didn't think anything of it until the deer stood up on its hind legs and walked across the road into the trees. She said when it stood up, she could notice that its face was horribly distorted with hideous gaping teeth and sunken eyes. Now, like I said, she's an experienced nurse, including the ER, and she's seen a lot of disturbing things. And yet, I have never seen her more nervous or rattled by anything in our four years together. She literally had goosebumps, which was the first time I've ever seen her have those either. When she told me the story, it scared the shit out of me especially in conjunction with what I'd seen, and it only deepened my sense of horror. I don't want to speak the name of the creature I believe it to be, 
but Dr. Lester included it in the title of this story. Recently, there was a big mouth neighbor out here blabbing loudly about these creatures. We told him to shut the fuck up and stop giving these things recognition because recognition is energy and we've seen where that gets us. There's a lot of legends and stories that come from this part of Michigan. Even stories of Sasquatch pop up now and again. The old folks seem to know a lot. It's frightening to realize how many of these things exist in such close proximity to our home. Now, I'm weary of all the wildlife I see in the area. Every yelp, hoot, or howl has me looking out the window scanning the landscape, especially when the sun goes down. Like all of you, I've heard the phrase, things that go bump in the night a million times. Now that I know that those things are real, the phrase takes on a whole new meaning. I'd like to tell everyone about two instances in which I witnessed creatures that everyone today refers to as Dog Man. Back in 2013, when the incidents took place, I don't think anyone was even using the word Dog Man. Of course, I'd heard of Bigfoot. There always seemed to be something on TV, and I knew that sightings went back for decades, if not further. But prior to my experiences, I'd never ever heard anything about large bipedal wolf-like creatures existing. In fact, if I hadn't seen it for myself, I'd have probably thought the whole thing was batshit crazy. Anyway, I live in North Georgia, not too far away from the Kennesaw Mountain National Battlefield. It's a beautiful area and attracts, I don't know how many thousands of visitors each year. At that time, I worked nights, which meant driving down a few really dark stretches of road. Well, on one particular night, I was going down one of those dark lengths of highway when I saw two deer make a dash across the road. Now, I'd seen deer lope or run across roads many times before, but there was something really, really strange about these two deer. I tapped the brakes to slow down, and at that moment, I saw what was pursuing the deer. They looked canine, except they were bipedal and incredibly large. I could see that they were each between six and seven feet tall, and they chased the two deer, which were both smaller by the way, out across the street and into the woods. And these damn things ran in formation, like one in front and two behind, kind of next to each other. And they were roughly 30 to 40 yards behind the deer. And these things were muscular and fast, and I mean lightning fast. I could also make out that their fur was either very dark brown or black. Looking back on it, I think maybe I was in a mild state of shock at the time because I just sat there in the car for several minutes, staring wild-eyed out into the darkness. And the crazy thing is, like it could get any crazier, right? That wasn't even my last experience. It was only a couple of weeks later when I was once again heading home. As I drove past a cornfield, which was off to my left, something ran out in front of my car. Now the field had full grown corn stalks, but I don't know exactly the heights, only that the corn stalks were taller than me by a head and I'm just over six feet tall. But this time, I saw two more creatures. They were essentially similar to the ones I'd seen earlier large, fast, canine bipeds. And these things basically jumped the road, broke the corn, and landed 10 or 15 feet into that field on the other side and just kept running. This time I took special note to look at the fur. One was black, and the second one was black with white or silver streaks on its chest and back. Since the first three I saw were all one solid color, 
I thought that must mean that there were at least four different of these creatures. Now since that time I've seen a number of photographs online that are purported to be dogmen, but for the most part you can't really make out anything definitive. But I'll tell you this, once you've seen these creatures, once you've seen what they're really like and what they can do, you don't want any part of it. And you damn sure don't need convincing that they're real. At first, I thought it was a nightmare. In truth, it really was, not in the sense that it was merely the product of the subconscious mind, but in the sense that I was filled with the most intense feeling of terror that I'd ever experienced. It happened one summer night almost 10 years ago now, although it seemed somehow that it could not have been that long ago. Sometimes I feel as though time has been twisted, warped, and contorted to the extent to which I've resorted to actually writing down the dates and times of significant events, just to be sure. I awoke with a start, as if I'd been shaken into consciousness by an invisible force. From the moment my eyes opened, I was gripped by feelings of isolation, loneliness, and fear. It was as if I existed alone in the universe, floating in an endless sea of darkness. Still, I could hear the faint sound of the radio on the nightstand to my left. A dim orange light on the dial gave me a moment of comfort. Then my eyes were drawn to the foot of my bed, and standing there, grasping the railing, was a thing. A terrible thing that could not possibly exist. And yet there it was. It was built like a human, but its body was covered in very dark fur. Its head and face were wolf-like. Its mouth was open slightly, and it displayed sharp canine teeth and a sort of menacing feral grin. It stared at me intently with a pair of hellish yellow eyes, and I could swear that in my mind, I could understand exactly what it was thinking. There's nothing you can do to stop me. I am eternal. I am fear in the night. I could hear the creature breathing, or what I took to be breathing. It sounded like a low rumbling growl. And there seemed to be also waves of heat hitting me like when you check on something that you have in the oven. I felt as if this thing was trying to drown me somehow in evil energy. Then I remembered something, something that I'd read somewhere, something about driving away negative entities. I tried to fight back my fear. I imagined my room being filled with a golden light, a light of power and strength. A light of love and hope. The light of all lights. It was then that the look in the wolf thing's eyes changed. It was a look of unimaginable fury and hatred. And also fear. Then it started to slowly fade from the center of its chest out until it was gone. And I remember that the last of it that I could see was the expression of diabolical spite on its face. I never saw it again. I have no idea what it was that visited me that night. A demon wolf, a spectral or elemental being, some kind of strange alien thing. I just don't know. But there's one thing I now know for sure. Something that I'm forever grateful for. Even in the face of that which creepeth by night, I am never, ever alone.
I'd like to tell you about something that I witnessed a few years ago. Something so strange, so unsettling, even frightening, that from time to time, I even have nightmares about it. Now, I need to tell you up front, too. I've never really been that deep off into cryptids or anything like that. Yeah, I would sometimes see something on things like Bigfoot or Chupacabra on TV. But that was just every now and again, and I found it more interesting and entertaining than compelling. Anyway, this happened three years ago. It was the middle of summer. Now, I live in a cul-de-sac, and mine, like most, have a tall light pole, and at the top, there was a metal arm about five or six feet long. And at the end of that, was the housing for the lighting element, which I assumed is a huge, powerful light bulb. It lit up the whole circle. Well, on this particular day, there was thunder and lightning with moderate to heavy rain. And it tapered off somewhat as afternoon gave way to evening, and by nightfall, there was only a slight drizzle. I stepped out onto the front porch, lit a cigar, and soaked in those scents and sensations of a midsummer rainstorm. I caught a flash of movement. It was more like a sensation, but my eyes were immediately drawn upwards toward the street light. I was surprised to see what I thought was a large bird perched up on that metal arm extension. Maybe an owl or a hawk. Maybe even a buzzard. But as I looked closer, I was shocked at the realization that it wasn't any of those things. What I saw was something with a huge pair of wings, a pair of raptor-like talons gripped around the extension, but the rest of it, oh my god, the rest of it looked like a woman with fine feathers distributed across the body. There was definitely a feminine quality to it. I won't elaborate on that. I stood there on the porch, motionless, with my eyes fixed on this whatever the hell it was. I remember those words running through my mind. What the fuck is it? That's when the thing snapped its head around and looked directly at me with a pair of glaring hot red eyes. Then it opened its mouth and hissed at me. I had the feeling that it was furious that I'd seen it. Then it leapt up from its perch, opened its huge wings, and flew off into the darkness. As it vanished from view, I could hear the sound of its wings beating against the black air, and then only the sound of faint raindrops. So that's it. That's what I saw. I'm way over the question of how could something like that be real. Fact is, it's real because I saw it. But what I can't seem to reconcile with it all is... Where could something like that possibly come from? And there are times when I don't think I even want to know the answer. The incident that led to the story that I want to share with you happened in late summer 2018. It was in the mountains of North Georgia. I'm a surveyor with 20 years experience in Georgia, Tennessee, Alabama, and North and South Carolina. So I'm extremely comfortable in the woods as I spend so much time outdoors, most of that time being very far back in the forest. A great deal of it is on national forestry land. Now, it wouldn't be unusual to not see anyone for days at a time. 
On the day it happened, I was surveying a piece of property around a small Corps of Engineers lake bordering a large tract of National Forest land. I was operating a robotic survey total station, which means you don't need a partner to run a survey crew, and instead of having two or three people on a crew, you generally work alone. The property was fairly large, approximately 500 acres made up of mostly steep mountains and hollows covered in dense mountain laurel. Now I just finished up cutting a traverse line along the property line, running to the top of the ridge roughly 350 to 400 feet away with my machete. Traverse lines are typically about five feet wide and cut as close to the ground as possible to ensure a line of sight for the instrument. I just walked back down the slope to get ready to traverse to the top of the ridge when I noticed someone or something hairy wearing what I originally thought was a hat slowly walking along the opening that I just made a few minutes earlier and stopped to look at me. It had a large hand reaching up to grab the tree limb it was next to. At the time, I thought someone must have been walking or hiking to the top of the ridge as it's not uncommon despite the isolation, to see people from time to time. But then I realized it was way too fucking hot to be wearing a large, shaggy brown jacket as it was in the high 90s. And as it started downhill at me, I could make out pointed ears on the top of its head and a long snout. This thing could only be described as a gigantic wolf. I can't stress how fucking big this thing was. Even from the distance that we were apart, I could hear it letting out a low rolling growl. And after a few minutes, it slowly walked out of sight. Now at this point, I took out my headphones and started paying closer attention to the situation. As I took out my headphones, I realized it was dead silence in the woods. And in Georgia during summertime, it's always extremely loud with insects. I waited a few minutes and walked to the top of the ridge to grab my equipment, which I had seriously considered leaving, to see what's going on, and noticed disturbed vegetation leading in the direction I saw it walking. Thinking harder about what was happening, I realized that the lower limb on the tree I saw it walk behind as it went out of sight was right at six feet tall, and what I originally thought to be a jacket had to be fur. That's when it all kicked in and I got scared. I could hear something moving in the short distance coming from the area it walked to. So I was like, shit. I decided to start making the 45 to 50 minute walk back to the truck. Then I started hearing movement up on the ridge, parallel and above me during my walk back. I didn't think the creature was moving in reaction to me necessarily, but I damn sure wasn't willing to wait around and find out. I made it to the truck, and since then, I've only told two people about my experience. That was pretty much it as far as the encounter went. I know it wasn't a bear. I've been around them my whole life and seen them plenty of times. There was no mistaking what I saw for a bear. On top of that, I've been into the deep woods on many occasions and experienced all sounds and signs of life and I've never seen them just disappear at the drop of a hat. I carry a pistol every day, and on some occasions, a short rifle if the job calls for it, due to bears, wild hogs, finding illegal pot growing operations, etc. But I can tell you, on the day I saw this creature, my weapon brought me zero comfort. I was scared to my very core. And I have a new sense of respect for the woods now, I'd advise that if you work alone in the woods, please, please pay attention to your surroundings. I think a lot about what might have happened if I hadn't looked up when I did, or if I'd been a little slower walking back downhill. If that goddamn thing had wanted to get me, I wouldn't be here today. I know now I was in just a few yards of a creature up on that ridge with no idea I was being shadowed by a monster. You know, people go missing all the time in the woods and are never seen again. And now I believe I know what takes some of them, because I've seen it. Now, whether you believe me or not is of no consequence to me. 
but it took me a long time to feel comfortable telling anyone about my experience. If it helps one person pay attention in the woods, I'd be happy to be called crazy over it. But as far as I'm concerned, it was a goddamn nightmare. Hey everybody, this is Dr. William Lester, and I want to tell you about a new membership opportunity from Blackwater Media. Now yes, you can sign up for the regular Swamp Hunter Society membership at $4.99 a month and have access to the premium content. But, you also have the option of getting the Blackwater Media VIP full year membership. That's right, with a one-time payment of just $49.99 you can have the same access to the same premium content, early releases, at a savings of almost $10 off of a regular membership. So if you enjoy the finest in paranormal and cryptid horror, head on over to blackwatermedia.net and get your Blackwater Media VIP full year membership. One night, many years ago, I was standing on the deck that comes off the back porch of my house and I was just looking around at my plants and up at the sky. Fall was coming on and the weather had just become a little cooler, so I was enjoying the transition to autumn. I always felt that the change from summer to fall was a time when things would start to get a little spooky, and what I saw that night completely reinforced that feeling for me. I live in a city of about 1.5 million and live close to downtown, just so you know that I don't live in the country or anywhere else close to a rural area. Now to paint a picture, the back end of my backyard had about a 30 foot cliff that ran along all of the houses on my street. I was standing about eight to 10 feet from my parked car, which was at the end of a gravel driveway. I had a solid wood fence gate with remote control that was closed at the time. And all of a sudden, I heard a strange noise coming from the street, from the other side of the gate, but couldn't see what it was. It kind of sounded like small animals running on the gravel towards the gate, so I looked in that direction. It was dark, but I had a porch light that somewhat lit up the area. And I saw what looked like three or four ferrets, but they were much longer, maybe three feet long and jet black. They ran under the gate, which is about four inches above the ground, and ran up the driveway, under my car, and then straight past me in the grass and off the cliff and kept going down the cliff from what I could hear. As they went past me, I still couldn't make out what the hell they were. They almost looked like snakes, but they were furry. I couldn't make out faces, legs, or where the body ended and the tail started. They just looked like long furry black creatures and they ran in a straight line and rather fast. It seemed like they knew where they were going, like they'd been through my yard before and knew just where to go. And I was stunned. It happened so fast and I didn't know what they were. Later on, I wondered if they were some kind of weird animals that I hadn't seen before. Then I thought, hell no. Then I thought, Maybe they were some kind of strange alien things. Or maybe even creatures from another dimension or time that might cross over into this reality occasionally and scurry around. But the truth is, I still have no idea. But I am sure of one thing. My backyard is weird.
You know, in this life, you're confronted by a million questions and nowhere near that many answers. Sometimes those questions spill over into the realm of mystery and the strange, and sometimes the downright bizarre. Well, I want to tell you a brief story that I think you'll agree certainly qualifies. In late June of 2005, I headed south on Highway 169 from my home in eastern Kansas to Tulsa, Oklahoma to attend a youth baseball tournament that my son's team was playing in. My wife had gone on ahead the previous day and I was traveling alone. It was late in the day, a few minutes before sunset on a bright sunny and hot day and I was just north of Tulsa in a suburb whose name now escapes me. All of a sudden, a strange creature darted across the road directly in front of my pickup and I got a clear look at it, mostly because of the time of day and the nearness of the creature. Now it looked for all the world like a little dinosaur out of a Hollywood film, perhaps you know the Velociraptor from the Jurassic Park movie? Something like that. Because it ran upright on two large back legs with the smaller front legs carried close to the torso, rather like a human sprinter would do. Its head was tilted back, and the mouth slightly open exposing a set of fearsome looking teeth, while the eyes had this wild fixed expression and were so wide open as to be slightly bug-eyed in appearance. And I thought to myself, what the goddamn hell am I looking at? Also too, it was shockingly fast and appeared and disappeared in a moment, but not so fast that I didn't get an absolutely clear look at it. I want to make that understood. It was not a cat, dog, squirrel, fox, possum, raccoon, or any other animal that I've seen. And I live in the woods and I see these more common animals all the time around here. Now I have seen other references to this type of creature on the internet, but if I hadn't seen the damn thing myself, I'd have chalked all that internet stuff up to bullshit. One thing though, what I haven't read in those internet reports was how absolutely feral and dangerous it looked. I do count myself lucky though, I mean lucky to have seen it. And the truth is, I hope that some way, somehow, I have the chance to see one of these creatures again. I had a very frightening encounter several years ago that I'd like to share with everyone. It was around 2015 or 2016. I remember it being summertime and the trees and brush were still full and lush. My wife and I were living on 12 acres of land in Mount Juliet, Tennessee. The land was mostly wooded with maybe three acres around the home cleared out with the exception of randomly spaced trees. There were two acres in the front yard and about one acre in the back. The house was built in 1969 and the state of the home was very much original to the time period down to that funky ass shag carpet. We originally moved in back in 2014 and over the years of living there we gradually worked on remodeling when we had the extra time and money. There were two small barns on the property and we turned them into chicken coops. We also decided to add a few sheep. Now I have to tell you this, the home itself always had an unsettling feeling. And when we moved in, the basement had a dark, evil feeling. And we found a freezer full of animal carcasses and a gallon bucket full of frozen blood. But that's another story. So, over the span of living there, we had problems keeping our chickens alive. And we couldn't find out how something could be getting in there. One day we got home from grocery shopping in the early afternoon to find all of our chickens dead and spread across our backyard. Didn't make any sense. We had that heavy duty hardware cloth wire caging that was torn like something clawed through it. 
We were concerned and not really sure about what to do. After all, we had the sheep to worry about too. I started sitting out at night and different times of the day when I had the time. I thought maybe I could hunt whatever it was that was killing our animals, but nothing ever showed up. We kept a close eye on our sheep the best we could and made sure they were well protected. That came to an end one morning when we went out to feed them and found them dead, torn to bits and scattered all over the place. Not too long after that, I got a look at what was causing all the trouble. Like I said at the beginning, it was summertime and I had the windows open because the AC wasn't working well on the second floor and I wanted to get a breeze going through the house. My wife was at work and I was busy putting our laundry away in the upstairs bedroom. Anyway, I started hearing this deep growl sound and a slightly higher pitch growl with it. It was coming from outside and I couldn't tell what it was so I stuck my head out the window to listen better. I could hear it coming from the woods on the right side, slowly getting louder, slowly getting closer to being in view. As the sound got closer, I felt my heartbeat picking up. I felt fear. I felt dread. And I was scared, but I wasn't sure why. That was until it came into the clearing. And there it was. A gigantic wolf walking across my front yard. It was walking on all fours and it had a giant canine head and a slightly hunched back. It had a long bushy tail and its fur was thick on its chest and back and it thinned out on the legs. As it was walking in the front yard, I was able to get a little bit of a measurement of it when it walked past a tree. It was at least five feet standing on all fours to its shoulders. So I estimated that it would have to have been seven or eight feet tall if it stood straight up. Now a slightly higher pitch sound was coming from behind it and following quickly on its heels was an identical creature, only much smaller. Even in that insane situation, I had enough of my wits about me to conclude that whatever these damn things were, it was clearly a mother and it's young. Of course, I was frozen by what I was witnessing and I didn't even think to try to photograph it. I guess in that moment, I didn't want to miss anything. It carried on across the front yard going deeper into the woods and just as it disappeared into the brush, I saw it stop momentarily and actually rear up on its hind legs just for a few seconds and it looked around. I remember thinking to myself, what in the goddamn hell did I just see? I told my wife about everything I'd seen and she believed me straight away. I never saw it again after that day. Also, I never went outside without a firearm for protection after that. We ended up moving out of there in 2018. So now when I see and hear people on social media screaming and arguing about whether or not a creature like Dogman could exist, I just kind of shake my head and laugh to myself because you see, theories are fine, conjecture is fine, but seeing is believing.
Sometimes, over the course of one's life, there exists the possibility of experiencing or encountering something beyond belief, beyond understanding, and perhaps even beyond explanation. And that experience changes a person forever. I live and work in the city of Atlanta. Seven years ago, I inherited a house at about 30 acres of property near the city of Macon, which is about 85 miles south of Atlanta. I came to decide to use the house as a retreat, a place that would serve as a getaway so that from time to time, I could get out of the city to relax, unwind, and perhaps do some fishing. The house was a small but tidy, comfortable ranch style and was situated almost at the center of the property. The land itself was just west of the Ukmulgee River. East of the river lay the Ukmulgee Mounds National Historic Park. Many different native cultures had occupied the area since at least the Ice Age, and the mounds themselves had been constructed around the year 900. Within the confines of the park, there are seven mounds. Anyway, three years ago, my girlfriend and I decided to spend the Labor Day weekend at the house. We both got off work early that Friday, and since we'd already gotten our things together, we got in the car, loaded cooler and all, and hit the highway. Before getting to the property, we stopped in town to do some grocery shopping for the long weekend, primarily deli sandwiches for that night, and a big bag of charcoal, a couple of steaks and chicken wings, and a big tub of potato salad for the rest of the weekend. Anyway, we got to the house, settled in, and enjoyed sandwiches and coffee. That first night came and went as planned, and with no indication or even hint of what was to come. The next day, we visited the park to see the historic mound sites. We walked a couple of the trails, snapped some pictures, and generally soaked in the surroundings. We weren't out there that long. Middle Georgia can be quite warm in early September, and we were both looking forward to an afternoon and evening of cocktails and steaks on the grill. Later on, back at the house, I prepped the grill while my girlfriend, her name is Kelly by the way, got the steak seasoned up and ready to go. We set up a couple of tables on the patio, and after the grill was lit and the steaks were on, we lit three or four of those outdoor candles that are supposed to keep mosquitoes away, and I turned on the stereo. Anyway, the dinner was fantastic, and as afternoon grew into evening, we enjoyed the drinks and music as the sunset gently gave way to late summer darkness. It was then, in full darkness, that the pleasant tranquility of the night was shattered by a horrific sound coming from the surrounding woods. We just looked at each other, bewildered by the howling that cut through the air. It wasn't a coyote or dog. It was too loud and deep. And I was like, what the fuck? And just as those words came out of my mouth, Kelly came up out of her chair and pointed to the wood line slightly to our right. Now I'm going to do my best to describe to you exactly what we saw. This thing was incredibly tall with long, thin legs and arms. I'm estimating 10 to 12 feet tall. It had clawed hands and its legs were hocked out like a canine. Its head and face were also canine-like, and it was covered in what looked like badly matted dark brown or black hair. But the eyes? Holy shit, the eyes were insane. They were huge, bulging, and white, and seemed like the size of softballs. It was almost as if they were too big for their sockets and were extending way out of the creature's face. It was an absolute goddamn nightmare. We watched it there at the edge of the tree line. It seemed to sway in one direction and then momentarily to the other. We could hear the sound of its shuffling feet and a low rumbling growl. It was almost as if the creature was hesitant to break the wood line, even as if it were somehow being held back or restricted from moving beyond that point. Then as we watched, the creature ambled back further and further until it disappeared from out of view back into the forest. A few moments after that, we heard another bone-chilling howl, 
the sound of which indicated that the thing was moving off in the distance. Although we stayed there for the rest of the holiday weekend, we didn't see or hear anything else that could be considered strange or even out of the ordinary. Since that time, Kelly and I have talked about it from time to time. And whenever it comes up, she refers back to our visit to the Elk Mulgee Mounds. She had the idea that some way, somehow, something had been disturbed there. Something that was better left undisturbed. You know what? I think she's right. And I also think that although the thing terrified us, compared to what might have happened, we got off easy. Where do I begin? What I'm about to share with you took place in 2018. I arrived in this small rural town called Cape May. The company I was working for at the time was sending me out to go door to door advertising cable and Wi-Fi that they wanted me to sell. Now I was getting weird vibes all throughout that day as the town itself was very small and a bit creepy with people staring at me or giving me the cold shoulder for the entire day. It seemed like a lot of townsfolk that I encountered that day were on the edge, and it was weird. There was a tense atmosphere that I shrugged off, as people are weird all the time. I continued doing my job, chugging a Red Bull to keep me going, which surprisingly didn't affect me at all. Besides the weird atmosphere, the scenery was actually quite nice once you got off the main road. I had to stop at different streets, and somewhere in the woods on long and seemingly picturesque, endless roads. It was quite scenic. Just before sunset, I was scheduled to visit a few houses on a small peninsula. Now, to get to this peninsula, you had to go down a very long road past a summer camp area, past a trailer park, past the woods, and then you finally found yourself in a small open area with a bay marsh, a couple of expensive houses, and shore access. The houses were so close to the water it seemed to be a code violation, but I was pretty sure they were built to withstand storms since they looked so expensive. Every house had its own theme, and the area was mostly deserted. Only one house had someone inside, whom I talked to after knocking on its door. I was so distracted looking at the houses and scenery that I didn't notice how fast sunset was approaching. I came to the realization that I should start heading back to avoid being alone on that long deserted pathway in the woods. Now to be honest, I was never one to feel comfortable after dark and isolated places, especially without cell service. So I was making my way down the path, so far so good, and it wasn't completely dark yet. As I approached the wooded area of the road, I was walking a bit faster since there were no street lights and the sunlight was rapidly disappearing. So as I was walking along at a decently fast pace, I noticed something. The woods were eerily quiet. All the life that I'd heard before was gone. No crickets, no birds, just pure silence. I stopped in my tracks and got chills down my spine as I felt the feeling that I was being watched. I looked around the dark woods for any sudden movements and then, like clockwork, something up ahead made its way out of the tree line. It looked to be some kind of large animal, and my brain went into overdrive, analyzing whatever this animal might be. Was it a bear? A deer? No. It looked like a large dog. But dogs couldn't get that goddamn big. Nowhere, no how, and under no circumstances. Although I was intimidated by its large size, whatever it was hadn't noticed me. Even though I was scared, I also didn't want to walk back and go into that one man's house that I'd spoken to. I didn't want to hear any shit about 
being from the city and freaking out by the least little thing out in the wild. I just didn't want to hear it. Now, while I'm thinking about this, the large animal in the distance had finally noticed my presence. It was observing me, not entirely sure of what to do with me. There wasn't much light anymore, but I could definitely detect a canine type face. Whatever I was looking at was definitely too big to be a black bear with a shoulder height of at least five feet on all fours, which is comparable to the size of a brown bear. The mass of this creature was extensive as the outline of what I could see looked like a wolf on steroids. It was muscular as hell. I also noticed that the outline of its face was very similar to that of a German shepherd or a wolf as it had perked ears and a long snout. In the heat of the moment, I could only hear the sound of my heart palpitating as fear and adrenaline started to crawl its way into my bloodstream. I felt as though time were standing still and then it dawned on me. What I was looking at was not a normal animal and it was simply too goddamn big to be any animal that I could recognize from the damn New Jersey catalog of fauna. And if it wanted to attack me, I would have been powerless against it. It was just too big. And I tried to calm myself down. I thought of the idea that this creature was out of the ordinary because I could rationalize it somehow. I made my brain go back to the idea of this being maybe a large dog or coyote. I also at the time did not think there was anything to the idea of cryptids. For the most part, I was completely unaware of what size coyotes are supposed to be anyway. So I made a quick decision. Realizing that this could very well be a life or death situation, I came to the conclusion that this very large dog-like creature was probably a skittish coyote that I could scare off, at least temporarily, to calm down my nerves. I mean, think about it. What the fuck other choice did I have? The longer I kept standing there, the more aggressive I might come across to this animal. And I didn't want it to get territorial or get the idea that I was easy prey. So guess what? I decided I would make the most hideous, loud, confusing, and startling scream or howl I could muster and just sprint the rest of the way. After I hollered and yelled as hard as I could muster, the animal quickly changed its body language to defensive. And then it quickly changed its mind to deciding I maybe wasn't worth a fight. And it ran a decent distance into the woods, but not too far. But here's the shit. It ran upright on two legs. And I thought to myself, what the fuck is going on out here? I decided to sprint as fast as I could past that area and beyond. I sprinted until I reached the end of the road and noticed there was that summer camp area with street lights. I rested on the top of a table, out of breath and feeling my heart pound out of my chest. I was shaken up, but I still had that feeling that I was being watched. So I kept my eyes on the tree line. I was looking for any sign that that creature might still be out there. Once I felt like the coast was clear, I located the next house I was scheduled to visit and I quickly made my way over. I met a nice family who ended up buying cable from me and I told them what happened to me that night and also how I was treated by the locals. The lady of the family who I presumed to be the mother said, I don't know why they sent you out here alone. These woods are dangerous after dark and there are creepy people who live around here. Now, the impression she was giving me was that there were animal encounters she couldn't explain. And also there were lots of ex-convicts in the area and people who should have been arrested, but haven't been. And she was also concerned about animals as she said that there were pets, dogs and cats gone missing, never seen again. And that gave me goosebumps too. How many times over the course of the day was I in real danger? Anyway, they were extremely concerned for my safety told me to contact my team leader so I could get picked up. They said they didn't want me to go outside again and that I should call it quits for the night and not go to any other houses. And to this day, I still have no idea what that creature was. But from what I've read on the internet, people are calling it Dog Man. There are strange things in the woods. Things that people don't talk about. 
and sometimes even try to cover it up. I felt like the town folk knew something about what I encountered. And I tell you, this is some shit I don't ever want to have to deal with again. If you're from the Lone Star State, then you know that Davy Crockett is an important figure in Texas history. Although a native of Tennessee, Crockett left his home state after serving as a member of Congress when another individual was voted into his seat. This spawned his famous quote, You all may go to hell, but I'm going to Texas. Although initially attracted to Texas by the allure of cheap land and natural resources, upon arriving Crockett had many adventures which eventually led to him to advocate for Texas independence. He fought for the Texas Army in its quest to become its own nation free from the rule of Mexico, and Crockett famously died defending the Alamo. An avid outdoorsman, Crockett is mythologized for many of his skills as a woodsman, such as killing a bear with a knife when he was only three years old and wearing a coonskin cap. While some of these feats might be fantasies, there's plenty of evidence in Crockett's own journals and correspondence with friends and family that document his skill in the wild. One encounter that you may not know about is the time that Crockett allegedly came face to face with a Bigfoot. Upon traveling into the interior of Texas in what is close to the national forest that's named after him, Crockett wrote in a letter to his brother-in-law about an encounter he had with a creature that he described as the shape and shade of a large ape man. I want to now share with you the contents of Crockett's letter. William and I were pushing through some thicket, clearing the way when I sat down to mop my brow. I sat for a spell watching as Williams made his good and fine progress. I removed my boots and sat with my rations, thinking the afternoon a fine time to lunch. As the birds whistled and chirped, and I ate my small and meager ration, I tapped my axe upon the opposite end of a fallen tree I rested upon. The letter continues. Whether it was the axe's disturbance or possibly the heat of the sun which caused an apparition to slowly form in front of my eyes, I do not know. As a Christian man, I swear to you, Abe, that what spirit came upon me was the shape and shade of a large ape man. The likes we might expect among the more bellicose and hostile Indian tribes in the territories. The shade formed into the most deformed and ugly countenance, covered in wild hair with small and needling eyes, large broken rows of teeth, and the height of three foundlings. I spit upon the ground the bread I was eating. Crockett continues, The monster then addressed a warning to me. Abner, it told me to return from Texas to flee this fort and to abandon this lost cause. When I began to question this, the creature spread upon the wind like the morning steam swirls off a frog pond. I swear to you, Abner, that whatever meat or sausage disagreed with me that afternoon, I swore off all beef and hog for a day or so afterward. Less than six months after the writing of this letter, Crockett was killed at the Alamo with approximately 190 others. Santa Ana's army swept north and east in an attempt to snuff out the Texas Revolution. That being the case, no clarification on the information in the letter was ever given. Most historians feel that the account in the letter was just an attempt by Crockett to entertain his brother-in-law. Some, however, feel differently, 
Many point to the fact that Crockett swore his account was true not once, but twice in the letter. They also point to how Crockett had insisted on changing the wording of the Oath of Allegiance as evidence that he took his honor seriously. The wording changed in the oath included the addition of the word Republican before the word government. That way, Crockett would have been obliged to defend a rogue government run by a non-elected dictator. It is this very change in the agreement that allowed Crockett to fight against Santa Anna with a clear conscience. Would Crockett have sworn the tale was true in writing if it didn't occur? Now, the entire matter of the creature apparition appearing and verbalizing a warning to Crockett is about as bizarre an incident as I've ever come across. Certainly, the description of the creature given by Crockett matches the classic description of a wood ape or Sasquatch. The ugly countenance, covering of wild hair, and the small needling eyes described all sound familiar. So does the estimated height of three foundlings. Now, while there's no exact height of a foundling, a small abandoned child, most agree a safe estimate for this description would be somewhere between seven and eight feet. But that's where the similarities between Crockett's creature and credible modern Bigfoot accounts end. The claim of Crockett that the creature spoke to him and actually warned him to leave Texas is utterly unprecedented. I don't even know what to say about it. Crockett's description of how the apparition slowly formed and later disappeared like the morning steam off a frog pond makes the entire incident seem more likely to have been a lucid dream or hallucination of some kind. Again, it's all very strange. What did David Crockett see in the woods near Nagadoches in 1836? The likelihood is that we will never know. Something telling, however, is how few people have heard of this account. So many of Crockett's feats and experiences have been trumpeted and blown up to mythic proportions through the years that it seems strange that this tale has fallen between the cracks and remains largely untold today. Having said that, though, maybe it isn't so strange after all. Americans like their heroes, especially those in the distant past, to be without blemish, perfect images chiseled into marble. These heroes, men like Crockett, are revered to this very day and held up as icons. The legacy of such a man might be tarnished if such a story leaked out and became well known. Better to dismiss the tale as nothing more than a bit of yarn spinning on the part of good old Davy than to attempt to come to grips with the possibility that something genuinely strange happened in the deep woods of East Texas in 1836. Something very strange indeed. But still, there's something else here that deserves consideration. The creature we've come to call Bigfoot is undoubtedly a flesh and blood creature. After all, it leaves footprints, captures prey for food, and has been seen eating. There are even reports of the creature being injured and perhaps even killed by gunshots. However, none of this precludes the possibility of the existence of other types of beings, entities if you will, that have the ability to manifest and take on the likeness of a creature like Bigfoot. Such a being would have an etheric nature, appearing and vanishing at will, and perhaps even communicating telepathically. If Crockett's encounter is to be taken at face value, it is more likely that it was this type of being that he faced that day so long ago. Something to think about. Thank you for listening to the Shadowland Radio Show. To enjoy more paranormal and cryptid stories, visit blackwatermedia.net to listen to a vast archive of material. While there, consider becoming a Blackwater Media Swamp Hunter Society member and access all available premium content. You can also visit the Blackwater Media YouTube channel. While there, be sure to like, share, and subscribe. I'm Dr. William Lester, and I promise to see each and every one of you again on the flip side.
Many years ago, I had a series of paranormal experiences after which I can honestly say that supernatural evil is real. In 1983, I was 11 years old and went to spend a week with my first cousins. It was really hot that summer and the coolest place in the house was downstairs in the semi-finished basement where we also slept. Now everything was great until one day my aunt went grocery shopping and we stayed home and played in the basement. A couple of hours later, we heard the heavy front door open and my aunt and cousin Jen walking up the stairs. Well, you know, boys being boys, we were excited to see what my aunt had brought back for us and we ran up the stairs all excited. When we got to the living room, the front door was wide open and the back door was open, but no Aunt Joy or Jen. I thought it was weird, but nothing really scary. Now my cousins seemed very concerned and they started whispering back and forth and seemed scared. Tad and Jim both decided that we should play outside until my aunt returned home. A little later, when she got there, Tad and Jim ran into the house before me to tell my aunt what happened. Tad, being the oldest, told her. It happened again, Mom, to which she replied, Oh, Lord, son, we don't need this now. Then she looked over at me and then back to Tad and shook her head as if to say, Don't say anything else about it. Naturally, this got me curious, and the more I asked what this was all about, the more annoyed and angry he became. Neither he nor Jim would tell me anything. Anyway, the next day or so went along normally, and we were having a great time, enjoying summer and playing. And then one night, I saw it. Jim and I were sleeping on a mattress on the floor when something made me jerk awake. I looked over by the corner of the room and I saw what I thought was Jen just standing and being silent. I asked her what she was doing there and got no answer from her. Being tired, I paid no mind and quickly fell back asleep. In the morning at the breakfast table, I asked Jen why she was downstairs last night and she gave me a puzzled expression and said that she never got out of bed, which was upstairs. My aunt questioned me and wanted to know if it said anything or touched me. And I told her no and asked why. She said, well, you must have had a bad dream. I told her no, I wasn't dreaming. And she got kind of short and said my imagination was playing tricks on me. Now keep in mind, to me, she was making a big deal out of nothing. But I realized that something was very wrong and I was getting a little worried. My cousins acted very strange about the whole thing, which worried me even more. The day went on as normal, and that evening my aunt decided that we would sleep on a foam mattress in the living room. And again, I woke up in the middle of the night, and I sensed something was wrong. I mean, really wrong. I looked up at the head of the mattress and saw what looked like my aunt laying with her head propped up by her arm. I spoke to her, asking if everything was okay, and she said nothing. I sat up and started asking what was wrong, and still, nothing. And then I noticed her eyes were blacked out, and that really wasn't my aunt at all. I shook Jim trying to wake him up, but he wouldn't move. I remember that I really started crying and shouting for Jim to wake up. Then this demonic thing screamed loudly and got up and ran or flew into the hallway. It was horrible. It was a black shadowy thing and it left a terrible odor that's almost beyond description. My aunt and everyone came in screaming and asking what happened and I told her that it ran right past you. Jim jumped up and ran to my aunt who was crying. My aunt loaded us up and drove me home. I don't remember much after mom and dad hugging me and making me feel better. I found myself just not wanting to talk about it in the days following and put it in the back of my mind. About a month later, I woke up late at night and my aunt and my cousins were in the kitchen. They all seemed upset. It happened again, only it got worse this time. My aunt was bleeding from her nose and her face was all red and swollen and my cousins wouldn't even speak. They stayed the rest of the night and I moved in with grandma and grandpa the next day. Years later, my cousin Jim and I reunited and after a while, I asked what really happened and all he would say was, it was bad. I really don't want to talk about it. So I let it be. Now, my dad and I still talk about it and he being a tough war vet says, 
There's a lot of bad things in this world, and we probably don't want to know what a lot of them are. I think this was good advice. My aunt and cousins never went back. They even hired someone to retrieve their belongings. The house changed hands four times in two years. No one living there stayed more than three months. It still stands in a state of disrepair. It's been empty since 1985. I don't think anyone will ever live there again. That's the trouble with demons. The areas in and around Columbus, Georgia have a rich history. And with this rich history, the city of Columbus is also home to a great number of ghost stories. The stories continue outside of the city limits in the surrounding communities. Those stories include one that is not a ghost story, but more of a legend that seems like something out of a late night horror movie. And one of the most popular legends in the state of Georgia and it has to do with a werewolf in neighboring Talbot County. Talbot County is a small community located to the east of Columbus. The county is home to a little more than 6,200 residents and a rather quiet place for the most part. One year, parts of the county were devastated when a powerful tornado tore through areas of the county, including the city of Talbotton. However, more than a century ago, a story came out of Talbot County that seems as though it was the inspiration for a nightmare. The Burke family was a very prominent and well-off family in Talbot County. The family had several children and lived in a home in the Pleasant Hill area located near Talbotton. The children included one daughter by the name of Emily Isabella Burt. Emily's father died at the age of 37 and her mother inherited the family's 300 acre estate. Shortly after the death of her father, Emily's mother sent her to boarding school in Paris. The legend says that while in Europe, Emily contracted lycanthropy, a supernatural transformation of a person into a wolf, or to some, a mental disorder where a person has a delusion of being an animal, usually a wolf. After attending boarding school, Emily returned to Georgia. When she returned, her behavior was oddly different. People said that Emily was always sickly and distant. She often stared off into space and was known to sleepwalk. Shortly after her return to Talbot County, there was a rash of killing and slaughtering of wildlife, including sheep. Many of the residents believed that a wolf was to blame for those deaths. One night, local residents formed a posse and armed themselves to seek and hunt down the wolf responsible for the killings. According to the legend, an elderly man in the area who was a native of Eastern Europe told the members of the posse to melt down anything silver. They weren't dealing with a regular wolf. They were dealing with a werewolf. The posse armed with their silver bullets descended into the countryside seeking the beast. The story says that one of the members of the posse came across the wolf, and it was indeed a werewolf. The hunter shot the werewolf, wounding it, and the wolf fled into the woods and escaped the posse. Oddly, the legend says that the next day, Emily's mother found her suffering from a gunshot wound. A local doctor treated Emily's wound, and shortly after, her mother sent her back to Europe for treatment of lycanthropy by a specialist. The legend says once Emily was shipped off to Europe, the killings of livestock stopped in Talbot County. After an undisclosed amount of time in Europe, Emily is said to have returned to Georgia and was cured of the disorder she suffered from. She lived her life out and became a respected member of the community and inherited the family property, which included land in 
Talbot, Muskogee, and Meriwether counties. Emily died on June 18, 1911, and was buried at a cemetery in Woodland, Georgia. She was 69 years old when she died. So we're left with a mystery. Did a werewolf haunt the hills and woodland areas around Columbus, Georgia? We'll never know for sure. But what if it was true? What if? What if?